now available to purchase on Blu-ray is my latest feature-length documentary exploring the legacy of Street Fighter 2 titled Here Comes a New Challenger. It explores all the updates to the game from the World Warrior to Super Turbo. We cover the merchandise, the home ports to the 16-bit consoles and microcomputers. We delve deep into the live-action movie with director Stephen E. D'Souza. And we also cover the anime and more. We have interviews from those who worked at Capcom USA and Japan. We have insights from journalists who experienced Street Fighter 2 when it hit arcades. And additional interviews from fans and gamers who grew up with the most popular fighting game ever created. Follow the link below to grab your copy. It's limited edition, region free and comes with additional special features. First they found the diamonds. Solomon's men. A diamond mine of incredible bounty. Then they built the city around the mine so that it should be protected. Dr. Ross, Dr. Ross, we've got satellite from the Congo. So where is he? I don't know. He should have transmitted 10 minutes ago. What in God's name? I can see seven dead people. When we started out, it was so simple. Communication. That's what separated human from animal. Speech. And with this new technology, I can demonstrate it in a way in which it has never been possible to demonstrate it before. Hello, Amy. Thank you for the flowers. Peter. Hello, Peter. Very spooky. Amy's above average intelligence for a gorilla, certainly. But she's not a freak. You're gonna have to go down there, Dr. Ross. You're good in the field. You were good in Panama. This satellite is our communications cash cow. In three years, it'll be obsolete. I need a new cash machine. This diamond, this is it. What's this room starting to look like? It's the jungle. She's been painting the jungle. I don't know, Peter. She wants to go home. I will pay. I will pay for Amy to go home. We've been putting together a rather hasty expedition. To the Congo, the talking gorilla. So when do you think we will get to the rainforest? Hakama Hamoka, right? Yes, hi, hello. You're not looking for Solomon City again, are you? It's always been believed that King Solomon had a diamond mine in the Congo and a city called Zin. Half the safaris that have gone in there deep looking for it never made it back. That gorilla knows where it is. It is the city of Zinge. The same hieroglyphics over and over. What do they say? We are watching you. Help me! On the 9th of June 1995, Congo hit the big screen in the USA and made its way to the UK a couple of weeks later. Directed by Frank Marshall, who had directed Arachnophobia and Alive. Produced for a modest budget of $50 million, it went on to gross over $152 million worldwide, making it a success, but it was met with mixed reviews and nominated for seven Golden Raspberry Awards, but most were awarded to Showgirls. On the Siskel and Ebert show, Gene Siskel felt Amy's schoolgirl voice was so inappropriate. He said Joe Don Baker was a buffoon as a villain, he felt Ernie Hudson was a lightweight, he felt it was funny for a thriller, and how much of it was intended, summarising Congo as a mess. Roger disagreed and felt Ernie Hudson was fabulous, playing a Clark Gable-like character. He said the film was supposed to be funny. He said if people went to see it with the right frame of mind, they will enjoy it. Stop eating my sesame cake! Variety said what Congo lacks most is a sense of purpose, with the group embarking on their quest before the groundwork has been laid and the filmmakers trying to provide needed exposition on the run. It clearly feels as if the picture was edited to leave the action sequences in while removing any connecting material that might have helped them make sense. The Washington Post called the film a Spielberg knockoff, 
shamelessly lifting themes and ideas from a handful of Stephen's greatest hits. The paper also criticised Amy the Gorilla as the most disappointing performance of all, and that the supporting actors Tim Curry and Ernie Hudson stood out more than the lead actors. The New York Times said the 1980 bestseller is one of the last remaining Crichton novels not yet recycled into movie material, and now it meets its dubious fate. This glib, overheated film about vicious primates delivers little suspense, nor are the signs of the 65 cited volumes and articles that turned Michael Crichton's book into such a learning experience. Also missing is the inspired showmanship with which the author's paranoid naturalism was exploited in Jurassic Park. It eventually becomes Journey to the Centre of the Earth, verging on Planet of the Apes. Production values are lavish, but the storytelling is less successful even when it finally reaches this action-packed juncture. Paramount Pictures and the producers wanted to follow in the footsteps of Jurassic Park with their merchandise and there were times with Taco Bell, Pepsi, action figures produced, a pinball machine and video games which will be explored later in more detail. But as the summer schedule was stuffed with big movies, Congo would find itself disappearing very quickly with the likes of Batman Forever dominating the summer season. Over the years the film has become a bit of a guilty pleasure to those who grew up on it though it's still seen as a missed opportunity and considered one of the weaker adaptations of Michael Crichton's work. Writer and director Michael Crichton had just finished working on his latest feature, The First Great Train Robbery, which starred Sean Connery. And Michael wanted to work with Sean again and started writing a new book called Congo that he would develop into a screenplay tailored for Connery, whose character would be called Monroe Kelly, taking inspiration from Alan Quatermain as a homage to the classic pulp adventures. Crichton had discussed his idea with executive producer Frank Yablins before he had written the novel. Yablins liked the idea so much, apparently without Crichton's authorization, he sold the movie rights to 20th Century Fox in 1979, a year before the book was eventually published. Now it's unclear how Michael had reacted to Yablins' actions. Crichton, however, received a $1.5 million advance for the novel, screenplay and as a directing fee. He had never worked that way before, usually writing the book first, then selling it. This rapid development, however, resulted in Crichton suffering from writer's block. He eventually managed to finish the book and it became a bestseller. He started writing a screenplay for Congo in 1981 after completing the film Looker. However, the film ran into problems when Crichton learned that he could not use a real gorilla to portray the character of Amy, which led him to leave the project. In 1987, he was still hoping to make the film with Connery, but again this did not happen. Despite not taking part in the eventual 1995 film, Connery did go on to play Alan Quatermain, the character who provided the inspiration for Monroe Kelly in The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. After a number of failed attempts to get the movie off the ground, the rights had reverted to Paramount Pictures, and during the production of Jurassic Park, Crichton was impressed with the dinosaurs that Stan Winston's studio had created. Producer Kathleen Kennedy had shown an interest in Congo and pitched the idea to her husband Frank Marshall. She suggested Winston again for the apes. This resulted in Yablins, who still had the rights to produce the film, along with Marshall and Kennedy collaborating on this movie. Michael Crichton would have little to no involvement with the film, though the film's teaser trailer would credit John Patrick Shanley and Crichton as co-screenwriters, but the subsequent trailer and the film itself credited Shanley only. Shanley was a well-known playwright who moved into feature films and received an Academy Award for his screenplay to Moonstruck in 1987 and worked with Frank Marshall on Alive. Stan Winston had wanted the job on Congo badly. For one, Congo had much in common with Jurassic Park, Stan Winston's most successful endeavour to date but an even more compelling was this long-sought opportunity to create gorillas. But it was Rick Baker who had built a reputation for creating stunningly realistic apes. Stan Winston was seen as the robot man. Rick Baker was the ape man. Stan Winston wanted to challenge Rick Baker's turf. Congo was kind of a proving ground for me, Stan admitted. Or at least that's what I wanted it to be. I wanted to show the world that we could do gorillas too and do them well. For the main cast, we have Laura Linney as Karen Ross, a former CIA operative who now works for Travicom. She hopes to find her ex-fiancé lost in a previous expedition to the Congo. Laura had originally auditioned for the part of Dr. Ellie Sattler in Jurassic Park, but lost out to Laura Dern. The producers remembered Linney and her audition and cast her in Congo. Her breakout role came with The Truman Show in 1998, pretending to play Truman's wife for the long-running TV reality show. In the book, Karen Ross is written to be unlikable, so they tried to make her softer and more friendly in the film. Dylan Walsh plays Peter Elliott, a primateologist of Berkeley, California, who wants to return his mountain gorilla, Amy, to her birthplace in the Congo. The name of his character is used in reference to the British actor who specialised in movement direction, especially for non-human characters, 
and worked on Congo as the Gorilla Expert, and other features such as Greystoke, King Kong Lives, and Gorillas in the Mist. Dylan would continue working on film, but later moved to TV, and currently stars as Lois Lane's father, Sam Lane, in Superman and Lois. Tim Curry plays Hamulkama Hamulka, a Romanian who offers to finance the expedition. He poses as a wealthy philanthropist, but is soon revealed to be in dire financial straits. His real aim is to find the mythical lost city of Zinj, where he lost another expedition some years before. During the 80s and 90s, Tim was working as a jobbing actor in the USA, grabbing any roles that came his way, best known as Pennywise in It, and getting supporting roles in Loaded Weapon 1, The Three Musketeers, The Shadow, and lent his voice to many animated shows and video games. Later in life, he suffered a serious stroke, and on the slow road to recovery, he focused his acting to voice only roles. Grant Heslov plays Richard, Peter's research assistant. Grant was a familiar face during the 90s, playing similar roles in True Lies and Dante's Peak. He popped up in Enemy of the State, The Scorpion King, and many popular TV shows. Grant over the years has moved behind the camera to work as a producer. The always reliable Ernie Hudson plays Captain Monroe Kelly, who works as a mercenary and leads the group into the jungle. This role was originally written for Sean Connery when Crichton was in the early stages of making the film back in the early 80s. Ernie lays on the charm thick with his performance, and it's one of his favourite roles. He said, I never really envisioned myself as a leading man. After I saw my performance in that movie, I felt really good about what I was capable of achieving and what I had to offer as an actor. Joe Don Baker plays R.B. Travis, Travicom's CEO. Joe Don Baker spends the majority of his scenes screaming and shouting, making him one of the worst bosses to work for. He wants to find the diamond mines deep in the Congo to finance and expand his satellite technologies, as this is the last option to save his company. And finally, we have B-movie legend Bruce Campbell as Charlie Travis, Karen's ex fiance and R.B.'s son. Bruce had originally auditioned for the part of Peter Elliott, but lost out to Dylan Walsh. Bruce has often made fun of the film during conventions, pointing out all the great talent involved in making the film, and the big surprise to many how it turned out not to be very good. And to many fans who went to see the film, they were disappointed he gets killed off very early on into the opening act. It's coming at you and scream! Ah! Filming commenced in late September of 1994, and they wrapped in February of 1995, making use of locations in Costa Rica, Uganda, and Los Angeles with giant jungle sets being constructed at the former MGM lot for the final act in the city of Zinj. Production designer J. Michael River had his own challenges in creating Zinj. He said, we needed to invent a culture which is always difficult. We borrowed certain aspects from different cultures and put them together, so it had that distinctly African feeling, but with a very strong Egyptian influence, that the pharaohs originally discovered the mines, then bequeathed them to the Kingdom of Solomon. The production experienced smooth sailing for most of its run, although it lost a week due to constant raining in Costa Rica, and a lot of the locations were very remote, and required walking on foot with all the camera gear. The cast were a bit worried and concerned, as they filmed near an active volcano in Costa Rica, which would erupt from time to time, even when they were filming the behind the scenes making of. We're in the middle of the jungle. Oh, but there we go. I mean, you heard that? Oh, that's the uh, volcano telling us it's dinner time, chaps. <laughs> Problems with the Grey Gorillas in the design stage only intensified when the characters started shooting. The mine in which the Grey scenes were set was essentially a large, empty cavern of red rock. Stan Winston complained there was no foliage of any kind, and without it, director of photography Alan Davia was unable to justify the kind of dappled lighting that would have gone a long way in making the Greys look more authentic. In any kind of creature work, Stan Winston commented, so much of its success depends on the lighting and setting those characters are in. I wasn't at all happy with the Grey's environment. That big red cave didn't allow for interesting or dramatic lighting at all. The special effects team created a set that could rise and fall as the eruption caused an earthquake. As the actors jumped around and interacted with the set, the team at ILM would comp in the lava during post-production to complete the shots. The film opens in the deep jungle with a team searching for rare blue diamonds that could lead to a new communications laser. Travacom employees stumble across the ruins of a lost city near a volcanic site. Karen Ross and the CEO of Travacom lose contact with the team while tracking their progress at the company headquarters. Activating a remote camera, they find the camp destroyed and the team dead. Then suddenly, a savage ape-like creature destroys the camera. Travis asks Karen to lead another expedition to the site. Meanwhile, at the University of California, Peter Elliott and his assistant Richard teach human communication to primates using a mountain gorilla named Amy. With a specialised backpack and glove, her sign language is translated to a digital voice. Despite the success, Peter is concerned by Amy's drawings of jungles and the Eye of Providence, and seeks funding to return her to Africa. 
but the university is reluctant. Herkimer Hamolka offers to fund the expedition after seeing Richard's presentation with Amy, and as they begin their journey to Africa, Karen Ross arrives and asks permission to join since her visas will be invalid unless connected to such a venture. Peter is hesitant at first, seeing Amy's jealousy of Karen, but allows her to join and pay part of the expenses after Hamolka is unable to provide funding. The group flies to Africa and lands in Uganda, where they meet wilderness guide Monroe Kelly. Monroe reveals that Homolka had led previous safaris in search of the lost city of Zinj, with disastrous results. The group are forced to parachute into the jungle just before their plane is shot down by soldiers for entering their territory. On the ground, they encounter an indigenous tribe that leads them to Bob Driscoll, a wounded member of the earlier expedition. On seeing Amy approaching, Bob begins screaming in fear and soon dies. The team are spooked by his reaction. The group continue on boat and learn of the lost city of Zinj and its fabled diamond mine, and Hamolka believes that Amy's drawing suggests she has seen the mine and can lead them to it, but they are unaware that the city is being guarded by unknown creatures. Director Frank Marshall originally intended to use CGI pioneered on Jurassic Park for the gorillas, but opted for actors in suits and animatronics as the technology at the time wasn't capable of reproducing hair realistically in the computer. So it's left up to Stan Winston's crew to take on the challenge of bringing these performers in suits to life. They cast a main Amy performer at the studio, then sculpted Amy over her life cast. From that sculpture, the crew created a hero Amy head that was covered in silicon skin and with hair attached. It was one of the first times the studio would use these new silicon formulas, rather than foam latex for a character. The main advantage to silicon was that it simulated the translucent look and feel of real flesh, far more convincingly than foam rubber. But silicon had disadvantages as well. They discovered that it was too oily if they didn't get the formula exactly right. The oils would come soaking through and ruin the paint. The crew had to figure out what kinds of paint worked best and how to attach mechanisms to it, as it was heavier than foam rubber, so there was a weight factor as well they had to deal with. Stan Winston later said, We took a lot of artistic license with Amy that in hindsight we shouldn't have taken. Part of the artistic license was putting a lowland gorilla face on what was supposed to be a mountain gorilla, just to make her more appealing. She was cuter, but we paid a price for it, because there was a sense of reality that was lost in the character. Stan Winston's team created 12 genetically mutated grey gorillas for Congo, eight of which were built as fully articulated hero heads and suits. Because the greys were a fictional mutated breed of gorillas, the sculptors enjoyed a lot of creative freedom in devising their own designs. In the final film, the distinctive characteristics of the 12 grey gorillas were undetectable, as the characters were supposed to be seen only in quick cuts. But as mentioned earlier during the shoot, Winston was disappointed with how they were lit when the team entered their domain. ILM would handle the visual effects, with most of their work coming into play with the volcanic eruption. For Congo, they combined live-action stunts with miniatures and computer effects. The miniature of Zinj was massive and weighed about two tons, with 50 to 60 people working on it after a number of weeks. They had hydraulics underneath to make it rise and tip as it collapses. They used real eruption footage for reference material when they animated it in the computer. They designed a miniature blue screen volcano and filled it with explosive material. They used large balloons filled with fine dust. When they shot the effect at a high speed with the balloons bursting, it gave them the desired effect. The lava would be created in miniature form and composited into the live action footage. Using liquids that came in different thicknesses and they changed the colour of the liquid to yellow and orange in the computer. You can never escape the fact that you are watching people in suits pretending to be apes. You can either go along with it or just find it off-putting and cheesy. To give Stan Winston's team credit the close-up shots of Amy, the designers have done a fantastic job. The eyes look real, but though the silverbacks don't look too convincing, and the grey apes that do look well designed lose some of their threat come the end in the overly lit cave as they battle with the team. The miniature work is top-notch, however and many critics felt they used CGI for the lava, but that is not completely the case, and I think for the time they blend the live action footage, miniature work and CGI very well together. It's that nice sweet spot during the 90s when they didn't go full CGI and made use of the best tools available. Composer Jerry Goldsmith was originally brought on board when the movie was being conceived in the 1980s. Jerry had started his association with Michael Crichton in 1972 for the TV movie Pursuit. He would later score for Coma and The Great Train Robbery. Despite Crichton not being involved with the 1995 production, Jerry remained aware of it. Frank Marshall was in talks with James Newton Howard at the time, who had scored a lie for Marshall in 1993, and he had done some preliminary pre-tracking work in collaboration with Lebo M, a South African composer and performer who had worked with Hans Zimmer on The Lion King. 
When a scheduling conflict forced Howard off the film, Goldsmith's agent Richard Kraft brought on Jerry. Goldsmith and Lebo M hit it off really well, with Lebo M on board to arrange and perform with an African choir. Goldsmith took the unusual step of opening Congo with a song, Spirit of Africa. That became the melody of the film and is played throughout and gravitates towards Amy to create a warm theme that combines elements of traditional African percussion with a mix of electronic wind instrument that was capable of pitch bends in the sound. Jerry would follow a similar approach to his work on The Ghost in the Darkness the following year. The original album was released back in the summer of 1995, which only contained about 30 minutes worth of music, but thankfully it would get expanded by Intrada in January of 2013, featuring over an hour's worth of music. Congo is not one of my favourite scores by Goldsmith. I think the lighter approach didn't completely appeal to me. I think with the nature of the story and discovering the hidden city with these like mutant gorillas, I wanted something more threatening and darker with the approach to it. Of course, when it comes to the action scenes, Jerry always delivers, but as the action is a bit spread out and a bit sparse in areas, it leans towards the warmer touch, which is fine, but I think the score should have gone down a darker path. In 1984, Telerium released a graphic adventure game based on Congo called Amazon for the PC, Commodore 64, Atari ST, MSX and Apple II. Michael Crichton was a computer hobbyist who taught himself the programming language BASIC. In the early 80s, he and two other programmers developed an Apple II graphic adventure game based on Crichton's novel Congo. Crichton did not realise, however, that he had already sold all the adaptation rights to Congo to another party. The team revised the game moving the setting from Africa to South America and changing a diamond mine to an emerald mine and Amy became a talking parrot. Because the game was mostly complete, Tellurium was able to port it to the Commodore 64 before Amazon's release. The game sold over 100,000 copies, with the majority being sold on the C64. Come 1995, video games based on movies were very common, and one was being developed by Viacom New Media. It spent 14 months in development, 9 months into programming the game was scrapped and they were forced to restart due to comments from Viacom and the final 5 months the developers were exhausted and lost enthusiasm for the project. The game was intended for the Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive, but was later cancelled due to not being good enough for a release and the film hadn't really taken the world by storm, but the unfinished game did get leaked online years later. The game is split into five different types of gameplay, river rafting, shooting range, Amy going down a mudslide, Karen escaping from the cave very similar to the minecart level in Donkey Kong Country, and then the final level escaping from Zinge. If it was fully finished and released, I'm guessing it would have been heavily panned by the gaming press and been seen as another poor licensed video game. At the same time, a game was being produced for the newly released Sega Saturn titled Congo the Movie, The Lost City of Zinge and was released in 1996 only in the USA. The game uses elements of the film to tell a side story following the exploits of the only survivor of the first Travicom expedition, making use of FMV sequences. The game is a first person shooter that is very basic, clunky and overall pretty ugly to look at. Electronic Gaming Monthly said that the enemies look too cartoonish and that the game as a whole contributes nothing really new to the Doom genre. GamePro likewise deemed the game a dull Doom clone and also criticised a number of annoyances such as the poison which reverses the directionals, the inability to hear enemies approaching and the lack of depth in the graphics. For the PC and Macintosh, Congo the movie Descent into Zinge was released around the same time and was a point and click adventure game featuring FMV cutscenes to play out the story and the performances are surprisingly good, though not featuring the actors from the film. It certainly looks the most impressive out of the games released, but some gamers did point out the frustrating action elements and overly obscure puzzle solutions and you can't examine any object in your inventory, resulting in a lot of trial and error. The summer of 1995 was a good year when I was a teenager. Loads of big blockbusters coming out that season that had me very excited, with the likes of Batman Forever, Mortal Kombat, Waterworld, Apollo 13, Judge Dredd, and there was of course, Congo. The TV spots and trailers for Congo certainly had me very intrigued. From the writer and producers of Jurassic Park, it's an easy sell. So me and my friends went to see it the opening weekend, and I recall us quite enjoying it for the time. We were all 12 years old, so we were easily impressed. I would often revisit the film over time when it came out to rent on VHS and later picked it up on Laserdisc. As I got older, the film's glaring problems became very apparent, and recently showing the film to my girlfriend, who had never seen it, her summary of the film was that it was pretty boring. All the elements to the film on paper seem like a great adventure movie with action, horror and suspense, but the end results is a plodding movie that builds up to a rushed ending. As they return Amy to the jungle, the film wants us to be invested in her journey, but we don't really get to know Amy outside of a couple of things she likes and dislikes. The voice box to transmit what she is saying via sign language, it becomes very silly quickly. 
the trailers they used to promote the movie, they avoid showing that completely, as it would get laughed at. I can understand they wanted to give her a childlike voice, but the end results are just unintentionally funny and weird. Also, Amy doesn't get to do much. She walks around for a bit, gets frustrated here and there, and then when it comes to the big finale, when she jumps in to save Peter, she just sits there telling the grey gorillas that they are ugly. It's laughable. I was at least expecting her to throw a punch or swing her arms around to give the evil apes a bit of a challenge. One of the funniest bits is when the mountain gorillas encounter Amy for the first time and she talks to them in her usual sign language and they just look baffled. What the fuck is she on about? The main protagonist, Karen and Peter, are pretty much stock characters. Peter gets little to do outside of defending his job, whinging now and again and looking after Amy on her journey home. Overall, a dull character. Karen leads the charge when they encounter issues using her tech to protect them or keeping up with communications with her loony boss. No, no, Peter and Karen don't have any chemistry or stand out as memorable leads like Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler from Jurassic Park. There's a bit of friction between them at first and then they begin to become friends and trust one another, but it's all standard stuff you've seen before. Thankfully, Ernie Hudson and Tim Curry keep you engaged throughout the lukewarm storyline. Ernie lays on the charm thick and oozes confidence which leaves you feeling that he should have been the main focus. You want to see him go out on his own adventure and having Tim Curry along for the ride just for the hell of it. Tim just chews up the dialogue and overacts to everything, which is what you want from him and he totally delivers. The film's biggest strength is playing on the comedy when it's intentional, with Tim Curry stealing all the scenes. The film does generally keep its tone consistent throughout. It takes itself seriously for the most part, like Jurassic Park, but it has its moments of light-heartedness and it plays up the horror of the mutated apes and when they deploy them for the finale. The shots they compose and how well it's photographed play on the horror aspect within the rules of a 12 rated film and they push the idea that the grey apes are watching them, keeping the audience in suspense but this is few and far between. For a movie that sells itself as this adventure across the jungle, you'd expect some good action to give the protagonist some danger to run into but you just end up with a couple of scenes of mild peril as they travel from point A to point B. We have the quick opening sequence which is done to set up the Grey Apes. The team travel to Africa in the midst of a political situation with the army, but not much happens. Then they have to flee their plane to avoid being shot down. Now this is 40 minutes into the movie and not much has happened so far. Roughly 30 minutes later they encounter the hippos and some of the crew nearly get eaten. This lasts about a minute and a half. Then jumping 15 minutes later they find Zinj and experience their first attack. So for 75 minutes into the film it's been pretty uneventful. Grant Heslov as Richard I think probably gives the most believable performance during this scene. Throughout the film he hasn't had much to do but once he gets attacked off camera he comes running down the steps screaming out loud, bleeding and in a complete panic. It feels genuinely real. I remember it put me on edge as a young teen and it still works well now watching it as an adult. But the scene quickly gets ruined when the ape attacks and they deploy that druddery fake slow motion effect which always looks awful. It's a technique that was used in music videos and later filmmakers used it in films and it's never looked great. The battle with the apes at the campsite was always a bit confusing. They have gun turrets, assault rifles on hand and a laser sensor. For years I thought the laser hurt the apes but it appears just as a sensor for the turrets but it does look like it's burning them as they touch it. Next morning everyone seems alright. You'd think the team would be on edge expecting the apes to attack again. My pants would be full if I was in that situation. When they enter the home of the grey apes, the lighting for the majority of the scene looks like it takes place in a cave, but the introduction shot featuring a matte painting, it has no ceiling. It's just an open cavern with daylight pouring in, but the rest of the scenes show a sense of shadow over them. The lighting doesn't quite match what they set up. I think the biggest highlight for many at the time who saw it in theatres was when they finally get to shoot these apes, especially when Karen goes full Ellen Ripley and gets to use the laser gun that is powered by the diamonds to cut up the grey apes. It is a fun moment but it's kind of short lived and a bit clumsy with its execution, especially with the death of Tim Curry's character as the team don't do anything to help him. If you think about it, the grey apes would have been killed off anyway by the volcanic eruption as it's not triggered by anything that's related to the story it just happens to create this escape scenario. So if the team never entered the city, the eruption would have wiped out the apes anyway, though destroying the city in the process, but everyone would have been fine. There is definitely a lot of potential in Congo. It's a shame they dropped part of the story from the original book of other teams going into the jungle to find the diamonds, so there was a sense of competition and conflict to get to the city of Zinj first. It does remain pretty faithful to the book in other areas with many elements being retained, such as the focus on technology and communication. But I think with the adaptation from book to film, 
perhaps they should have taken key elements and shifted it to a more mature and darker direction to twist it into something different. I know they wanted the lighter touch to capture the adventure movies from the 30s and 40s, but following on from Jurassic Park, which is a lot different to the book, they took parts of it and structured it into something different for its film debut, and Congo should have followed suit and not aimed for that family-friendly approach and looked towards an older audience to make it try and one-up Jurassic Park which is a challenge in itself because they dealt with dinosaurs and not apes, which we've seen dozens of times before. But going with a more violent and scary approach certainly could have made Congo very memorable. Congo is certainly not a terrible film. It has some interesting highlights, and as mentioned, Ernie Hudson and Tim Curry keep you engaged during the boring moments, but it is a missed opportunity, which is surprising considering the talent on board. I don't think they will ever consider returning to the book for another adaptation, but if they do, a miniseries would be great, and a darker direction would be the best way to go. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and click the bell to be notified of my latest retrospectives and reviews. Big thanks to my Patreons for supporting the channel. If you want to get involved and gain early access to my content and exclusive videos, then follow the link below.